Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The combination of dental and uh, skeletal variations, uh, when combined, can be of special interest. When one has uh, variance in odontogenesis and variation in uh, skeletal uh, development and change, uh, they can present uh, interesting patterns. Today uh, we have with us uh, a 14-year-old young man uh, who will be helpful in demonstrating one of those things. What is your name? Leonard Chatfield. And where do you live, Leonard? Bay City, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to school? Central High. Mm -hmm. Have you had any injury to your teeth at any time? No, not that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe if we just take a little uh, overview of uh, Leonard's uh, facial configuration, you'll see uh, a few things that are noteworthy. Uh, in the first place, his uh, overall facial dimension, just close your teeth together, tends to be fairly short and full. The fullness is reflected perhaps more in the lower third of the face uh, than in the mid face, although there's also some prominence uh, here in the infraorbital rim areas. So on a general basis, we'd say that his lower jaw is fairly full. Uh, you can see the redundancy of his lower lip, which tends to curl underneath the protruding maxillary central incisors that we'll see in a moment. Uh, let's close again, Leonard. Close your back teeth together. And uh, one of the things that is noteworthy is a loss of so-called vertical dimension, which is due to the absence of posterior teeth, so that his jaws overclose, and as a result, the corners out here at the commissure tend to roll over, uh, making things moist and a bit vulnerable to uh, such things as fungal infections and the like. Now I would like to uh, have Leonard help us in looking at his teeth. We'll slide in some cheek retractors and uh, we'll get a view of some of this variation in dental formation. Would you try to close a little bit? That's fine. Now open part way. And as we uh, try to take inventory here, uh, Leonard has lost two carious molars in the mandible. But to our knowledge, that is his only previous dental loss. Note the irregularity of the almost jumble of mandibular anterior teeth, where lateral incisors on the outside seem to be rotated so that we are viewing the lingual surface. There are actually 180 degree rotations with the incisal edges curling toward us. Perhaps the uh, teeth that are more centrally located with larger crowns represent cuspids. Now we'll ask him to slowly close together, please. And as we look at the protruding incisor teeth in the maxilla, we see marked gingivitis from their exposure and uh, the accumulation of plaque. We see the apparent canines uh, farther back in the arch and contacting the mandibular ridge bilaterally. We assume those are canines, although there are only uh, molars behind them. But the overclosure, the fact that those, uh, there's contact of the rather extruded uh, canines down against the ridge uh, are interesting. I think I'll ask him to hold this left retractor and open a little bit. And we will, not quite that far, Leonard. And we will see the location here of a biopsy which was performed uh, about a month ago, and uh, a few minutes later, we'll be asking Dr. Kerr to interpret that biopsy for us. Before we do that, I think we'll take those out, Leonard. 
Uh, we will look at the radiographs uh, which demonstrate the skeletal condition. The Panorex view indicates for us some of the very interesting aberrations in the trabecular pattern of bone in the mandible. We see condyles that appear relatively normal, but immediately below the sigmoid notch here, there is suggestion of multiloculation and uh, septal type patterns, perhaps uh, cavitation uh, centrally. And as we go down, we see some of the interesting variations in the trabecular configuration that have been given uh, assorted names of orange peels and ground glass and so on. Uh, as we come toward the symphysis area, there are similar uh, loculated appearances of radiolucency. And these, of course, go across the midline and involve the ramus on the opposite side as well in a fairly symmetrical pattern. Uh, in the dental uh, revelations of these films, one sees the same things noted clinically, namely the long canines here back against a molar on either side and seemingly rather extruded and in contact with the edentulous mandibular alveolar ridge. Some of the expansion of this process is better seen in some of the other films of uh, the head. The lateral cephalogram gives us a profile view uh, illustrating again the marked uh, protrusion a labial inclination of these incisors, the cuspid again down behind contacting the alveolar ridge, and the soft tissue outline is here. Uh, one thing of note is the thin cortical expansion of bone out here. And again, this uh, symphysis and parasymphyseal area is expanded and is radiolucent. We can see the other radiolucencies uh, in the ramal areas, but they are superimposed here. And we'll look next at the PA cephalogram. In this projection, one can better appreciate the lateral expansion of the mandible. This uh, tendency for expansion uh, in the medial-lateral dimensions of the face and uh, here in the mid-maxilla, one can see again a suggestion of similar uh, expansile process. It is this expansion uh, that has led this condition uh, to acquire the descriptive name of cherubism. Uh, we'll return now to the patient, uh, just so you can be reminded again of these facial configurations. Returning to Leonard Chatfield, then, we do see uh, an overall facial uh, expansion, uh, a little fullness, perhaps a little prominence in the supraorbital rims as well. And uh, Leonard, have those teeth bothered you or hurt you at all? No. And uh, what about the jaw? Did that hurt you at all? No. And did you ever have any drainage or anything that uh, swelled up uh, excessively? In your jaw? Yeah, had an abscess tooth. Did you? A lower yeah. tooth? Yeah. When was that taken out? D it they just gave me medicine for it. Uh-huh. Now, since the biopsy that was right down there in your lower jaw, what's happened? It got numb. You have had some numbness since the biopsy. Yeah. Well, we certainly thank you for being with us today and telling us a little bit more about this situation. Okay. Thank you. The uh, clinical and radiographic uh, findings in a multilocular expansile process in the jaws can uh, give us some clues as to uh, what we're contending with, and we've already indicated one of the descriptive terms given to the clinical findings. It's obvious, however, that we will not know the exact nature of the pathology uh, without uh, biopsy and uh, the histopathology interpretation. We have asked Dr. Kerr to be with us today uh, to show the slides to you and to discuss uh, this aspect of this process. This is a very interesting lesion, uh, which, as Dr. Hayward has indicated, is uh, referred to uh, frequently as cherubism. 
It is a uh, congenital uh, lesion which has some um, hereditary uh, background and sometimes uh, designated as familial. It is referred to as uh, familial fibrous dysplasia. And fibrous dysplasia is a category of uh, disease processes which uh, are sometimes uh, classified as uh, fibroosseous lesions. And subtle variations distinguish between uh, one uh, lesion and another. So that the uh, histological picture must be correlated with the uh, clinical findings and uh, especially with the x-ray findings. The uh, slide that we have here today uh, is uh, one that uh, shows uh, a fibroosseous lesion. And we see uh, here uh, this lesion is um, made up of uh, fibrous tissue, uh, which uh, there are a lot of proliferating fibroblasts, and many of these fibroblasts are immature fibroblasts. Scattered uh, throughout uh, this uh, fibrous tissue are numerous small capillaries like this one and uh, like the one here and another one uh, that's uh, up here. And these uh, are scattered uh, throughout the uh, whole uh, section. Now this section varies uh, somewhat uh, from one location to another. Uh, one feature is that uh, there's a lot of uh, blood in it uh, which stains brown and this uh, blood is uh, this uh, <coughs> pattern of uh, brown patches uh, which is indicative of old blood. Uh, the blood uh, down here in the corner is uh, indicative of uh, uh, fresh blood, uh, which is the surgical hemorrhage. Also uh, in the uh, material, uh, there are uh, scattered uh, numerous uh, multinucleated giant cells, and these are the giant cells that we see at this point, and there are several of them here. Uh, and we can see a, a whole aggregate of them at uh, this level here. There are uh, tiny uh, fragments of the bone here. There's uh, some more bone fragments here. And uh, here's another uh, nice aggregate of uh, the giant cells. And you see the pattern is uh, quite a varied one uh, from uh, one area of the material uh, to another. Now I think we might uh, look at higher magnification and uh, we'll look at uh, some of these aggregates uh, that have the giant cells and show the characteristics of them. Under this magnification, we're looking at some of the bone at the periphery. And uh, on the uh, inner aspect of the bone, there's this uh, little pink line, uh, which is indicative of uh, new bone formation. Uh, there are areas of indentation uh, which uh, uh, are present here, which indicate that uh, this is a point of previous resorption. So the cortex of the bone is being resorbed and then remodeled with new bone formation. We look at the uh, central portion of the lesion. Uh, there are numerous uh, multinucleated giant cells, and uh, these are scattered, as we saw, under the lower magnification. Uh, throughout the entire area of the uh, specimen. Uh, on this one, uh, we can see uh, a multitude of uh, nuclei which uh, occupy the uh, large mass of uh, cytoplasm. And these are the uh, characteristic uh, osteoclastic giant cells which uh, make up uh, the uh, bulk of the uh, large cells of seen throughout this lesion. So it truly is fibroosseous with uh, multinucleated giant cells, and this is consistent uh, with the diagnosis of familial fibrous dysplasia or cherubism.
You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.